Okay, it is 10 o'clock. Good morning, everyone. Diane, are you ready to get started? I am, Madam Chair. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Okay, so the purpose of this meeting is to share information about encumbrances and expenditures, contracts that have been awarded, changing needs in the community, and projections of future need, as well as engage the public in a debate about how future coronavirus aid, relief, and economic security or CARES Act grant money is spent. Um, I would like to call this meeting to order. So Diane, if you would take the roll. Council member Dunaway. Present. Council member Days. Here. Council member Gray. Is Council member Gray with us? I don't think she's gonna be able to make it this morning. Okay, Madam Chair, you have a quorum. Great, thank you so much. Uh, the committee takes official notice of and admits into evidence all St. Louis County ordinances and resolutions. Um, good morning, everyone. It has been a few weeks, so there's gonna be a good bit of catching up this morning on all things CARES Act. Uh, we're gonna start the meeting with an overview from Mike Chapman's team about how county employees are working through the pandemic, the costs associated with keeping everyone safe in the office and plans for moving forward. Um, we're then going to hear from Cora Faith Walker with updates on CARES Act spending within our three areas of focus, public health, humanitarian and economic rescue, as well as any changing priorities and needs in the community since it has been a few weeks. And finally, we will begin a more in-depth conversation about the municipal league's request for $47 million. Um, to be clear, we understand that budget shortfalls alongside increased costs are squeezing our municipalities who are responsible for the delivery of a number of important constituent and government services. And we want to help our municipalities get through this crisis. But our priority in St. Louis County is saving lives, both today and as this crisis continues. And we need to ensure that our most vulnerable communities are protected and served. We have a limited amount of funding to continue responding countywide to our ongoing public health, humanitarian, and economic crises. And while we empathize with the plight of our municipalities and our neighbors, and we want to find ways to help, we have a duty to ensure that St. Louis County CARES money is spent the most equitably and most appropriate to the crises at hand, not to fill budget shortfalls in public safety budgets. We will start a conversation today about how best to serve St. Louis Countyans and our municipalities and we'll try to start to identify a process through which to serve more broadly. Um, and we will pick the conversation back up in uh, two weeks when we meet again to hopefully make even more headway. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to you, Mike Chapman. Thank you, Madam Chair. So with the outbreak of COVID-19 in the St. Louis region, um, we had to very rapidly pivot our county operations to a completely different mode, something that um, um, had never been done before. And uh, that mode focused on uh, continuing our essential services, protecting our, uh, the, the health and well-being of our employees and of that of our public. So, um, we uh, studied the, the public health orders and, um, and our, uh, our personnel policies. And fundamentally what we did was we, we stressed uh, maximizing telework, minimizing our uh, in-office footprint to the greatest uh, extent possible, uh, minimizing um, as much as, po as possible um, uh, paper products uh, and um, and so we uh, and and it's a process that we are is still going on we uh, we continue to um, explore ways that we can uh, protect ourselves protect our public continue our services um, I will say that um, 
in an interesting way, the pandemic presented an opportunity for us to to revolutionize the way we we do business here in St. Louis County, and to and to make some cultural changes in the in the way we do business that will uh, last far outlast um, this pandemic. Uh, telework, I, I don't see that going away. In fact, we you know our stress with the departments is. Uh, to uh, continue to do that and uh, to, to the most, the greatest degree, the most reasonable degree possible. And um, that, uh, that element of, uh, of our new way of doing business uh, will certainly be reflected in the planning for a new uh, government building. It will be, it, I, I, I see benefits to it every week. When I first came into this position, not a week went by that uh, that we had some kind of a a space challenge in our county facilities, and uh, those challenges went away when we began teleworking, and we and we came to the realization that um, telework can work for us. We can make it work, and uh, and we can still press on and do the important things that uh, our residents need of us. Another. Uh, uh, Pleasant benefit of uh, of the, the challenges of this pandemic was uh, the uh, the use of uh, uh, e-signatures, which um, has uh, has sped processes, and uh, it's the kind of thing that if if we had talked about doing that, in fact, there was discussion about doing that on and off before uh, the pandemic, and there were uh, lots of bureaucratic challenges, but when um, push came to shove and those challenges had to be overcome, they were, and now we're realizing that uh, that, that process is working well. Um, the reliance on uh, video teleconferencing um, is something that is, I think, going to revolutionize the way we communicate among ourselves, uh, with our residents, with our uh, municipal partners. So, um, in a in a curious way, you know, this pandemic has provided some opportunities for us to improve the way we do business. I th I think that uh, that our departments uh, rose to the occasion when they when presented with a set of of immensely complex and challenging problems to solve. Um, and um, I, I'm quite proud of the way we've responded and uh, and uh, the way we move forward. Uh, I'm sure um, several of the, you know, all the all the council members here have worked with our IT department, our admin department, our public works department, and you, so you've seen um, the great work they've done, and uh, it's just been inspirational to me. So, I mean, in a nutshell, that's that's what we've done. Um, there was, there seemed to be um, some sense that maybe we sent all of our employees home at some point and had some official date at which we brought all of those employees back. And that never happened. We just adapted to the new environment and continued the work. Um, we did close our buildings for a time to the public in the interest of uh, their health and protecting their health and uh, and reorienting as, as you, you're all aware, we've, we've reoriented our customer service. So all of that is on the first floor now, uh, street level, excuse me. Um, but uh, and that is, uh, I think, the, the the closing of the county to uh, county facilities to our public um, was conflated with closing our doors, just shuttering our buildings, and that never happened. Sue, do you have uh, anything you want to add about the costs and the the challenges of this, Sue Daniels? Um, hello, everybody. Um, I don't have too much on the cost. As Mike said, we just really, everybody just kept moving forward. It might have been at a different space, but uh, county employees uh, kept working through. Now, you know, when the county executive declared the state of emergency on March 16th, some employees weren't able to work from home. But then uh, in May 31st, when that stay at home order was lifted, then really people, all county employees started working again full time. And that's the time that we um, uh, transitioned into uh, paying our employees under the FFCRA, which was a new law that was passed uh, for COVID specifically. 
And so right now we are really, uh, you know, county employees that can't come to work because of a COVID related um, thing. They are then uh, able to apply for uh, this special um, FFCRA pay. And so we've had about 125 employees apply for that for one reason or other. Um, we've just have, we have about, I'd say about 40% of county employees, and I'm not counting the police department, but about 40% are working some sort of telework. And as Mike said, I think we will continue to do that. It's been proven that county employees can get a lot of work done from home. Uh, some with even, you know, watching children, uh, it amazes me, but, um, you know, but then there's about 60% of county workforce, and again, I'm not counting county police, that are really back to work. And again, you know, we're working very closely with the Department of Public Health to make sure that our employees are social distancing, we're wearing masks, we're taking temperature checks. So, you know, the em county employees that do need to go into a county facility or building to work, uh, I really think that we've done as much as we can to make sure that our employees are safe. Another aspect of, the, of uh, telework that I like is that I, I believe it will make us uh, a bit more competitive in the job market. You know, as we all know that the county government um, has a tough time competing with the private sector for salaries. Um, you know, our hope is is that um, if if uh, a job applicant um, sees that they can spend part of their time during the week working from their home office and part of their time working in um, in the county offices that that will um, uh, aid our ability to recruit good good talent um, so that's that's another positive uh, of of this any questions for us madam chair i have questions please councilwoman days Thank you. I'm looking at, um, well, first of all, if it would be helpful if uh, Mike, you could send us a copy of that plan, because I'm looking for specifics as to how we are returning to work. I'm looking at the, the amount of PPE that has been distributed and where that's being distributed. Uh, I'm, so I'm looking, and then also I'm looking at, uh, because we were requested to find out about the returning of uh, council meetings in person. Uh, I'd like to see your, your plan for that. We did have a, um, a cost estimate of that. Um, and so it is um, my, my concern that are we going to do that? Uh, is that part of your budget? Um, so I'm looking for, for some kind of a plan that you have. I'm assuming that you have written all this down so that we can look at it. Um, um, as noted earlier, we, we get a copy of of the um, proposal, or we get a copy of the presentation from um, uh, Core Faith Walker before we do that, so that we can look at that and formulate our questions. Uh, the second question ha I happen to be with our essential workers, and how what is the plan for the returning of all of our essential workers? Again, I'm looking for a plan uh, of how this is going to happen. We have janitors and mechanics and people like that who cannot. Uh, work from home, and so I'm looking to see what what kind of um, 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 efforts have been made on, on that part. I do know that uh, in the the Fort One, uh, we have been uh, you have been taking temperatures, and I asked earlier about the post checks. Well, how how was that COVID related? So we can stop there and let me get let, catch you catch you up. You can catch me up. Okay? <laughs> So that last question, you wanted to know how the temperature checks were COVID related. I'm sorry, I didn't hear all of it. No, 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 no. How the purse checks that you have someone there that goes through our purses when we're coming in the building and right. going through this, through, through this um, well, metal detector. So how is that COVID related? Yeah, uh, Councilwoman, well, I, I don't have people doing that. When we asked the police department to do health screens, uh, the police department asked for our security. They've been asking for, for quite a, uh, several years now, probably, 
um, they've been asking for the opportunity to do security checks as well. And we told them that that would be fine. That was the deal we cut. So they would do our health checks for us. And, and um, that process seems to be working fairly well. But I, I don't recall anyone ever saying it was related to COVID-19. It just happened to it, it was its relationship was that that taking the, the temperatures, I suppose, and asking the questions. So then the police decided that we needed to search our employees. That, that's what you're telling me. The police have been issuing concerns for years about uh, workplace violence and that how they're um, they. I, it's my understanding that their feeling was is that there was a gap in our security that we were checking visitors, but we didn't check um, our employees. I've worked in other places where employees have to go through security, so I thought that was reasonable. Okay, I know that uh, Councilwoman Gray had asked that question several times. We really weren't able to get, you know, a solid answer. So thank you for that. Well, that's a yeah, uh, that's so a question for the. I, I believe I I deflected several times, deferred to the the. Uh, the uh, police department, because I certainly am no expert on security, and I don't want to be making those decisions about what's what's best for the safety of our employee. That's that's one that I defer to them. Okay, and I don't think she received a response from them. If, if I'm if incorrect, that's fine. But I don't think she ever received a response from them. So, can you talk about the return of our in-person council meetings? We have received uh, the. Um, I guess a quote from our spring, I believe, as to what it would take to do that. Are, are we planning to do that? What is the timeline on that? If you have that, please. Uh, Chairwoman, I am not involved in that process. That's been between your uh, council administration and um, and Spring Schmidt. And, uh, and I guess I would assume that if the decision was made to uh, to begin council meetings again, then our transportation and public works director, Deanna Venker, would be involved in uh, meeting with uh, admin staff and uh, discerning what uh, what type of equipment, what type of uh, PPE, plexiglass, or uh, things like that would be needed to do it. But uh, I'm not I'm not involved in that process. That's so. Is Spring on the phone, Madam Chair? Yes, ma'am, I'm here. Okay, can you answer the question? Um, so this this really is, we don't do the, the plans or the implementations. We make the recommendations that we think will help increase your safety. So the document that we sent is the, the list of the recommendations. So that would be the same that we sent, kind of some of our, the advice that we've given to other departments about how they can increase employee safety or constituent safety, just the recommendations that we've been using um, to help guide everyone uh, through through these processes. We don't have a an infrastructure or any uh, authority or 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 budget or anything. I think that would be your your council administration if you want to move forward with those recommendations and how those could be implemented in your in for the council. So is there anyone on the phone that can answer that question? I actually, it sounds to me um, from what I'm hearing from Spring and Mike is that it's a decision that we need to make. And I think it would be a cost benefit analysis that we would perform maybe a committee of the whole, maybe in a closed session. We'll have to figure that out later. Um, but it sounds like it's gonna be up to us. Because that, that was my point, you know, is it really worth it? I mean, we're doing quite well, I thought now, uh, with the virtual meetings, and uh, but that was a request of one of our um, one of our colleagues, and so I just kind of wanted to know where we were with that. I haven't heard anything since since that part. So um, I think um, I think that's all of my questions, Madam Chair. Thank you. You're welcome, Chairwoman Clancy. Did you? Have something? Yeah, I was just gonna um, respond to Councilwoman Days about the in-person meetings on the council. I think that that's a conversation that would, um, you know, a dialogue amongst the council and maybe our public health team and some others, perhaps at a committee of, of the whole, if there's interest in moving forward on that at this time. Um, I do want to note that um, in addition to what's in the report provided by public health, we have some legal considerations to make when it comes to meeting in person again, um, because we are a public body that, um, you know, in, uh, has rules that say that we need to include the public. And so if we were to come meet in person again, there's some tension between what's recommended in the 
report from spring and limiting the attendance in the chamber to 30 people um, versus, you know, what we normally do where as many people that can come can come. Um, so again, there's a lot, there's a lot of layers here. And if, if, you know, there's interest in the council and having this the committee of the whole, I'm totally open to that. Okay, th thank you for that. And again, um, if, if there's a, a plan that uh, Mike has, could he send that to us? please, so that we can have a chance to look that over and perhaps formulate some additional questions? Uh, uh, Chairwoman Days, I don't, well, there, we didn't draft a specific plan. We we listened, We our plan was the Department of Health um, guidelines and our executive orders. And all I did was I told each of our department directors that our stress is to protect your employees. So have as many of them working from home as possible, and those that have to be in the office to work to get their jobs done, do that. And and it was as simple as that. And uh, the rest of our, our employees comported themselves during this process was um, in line with both our personnel policies and our de Department of Public Health policies. Quite frankly, things were happening so quickly. I didn't have time to draft things, and they really we didn't we didn't conclude that we needed uh, any more of a plan than that. Madam Chair, yes, yes, Chairwoman. Clancy. If I may, I have a question. So, um, Mr. Chapman, does that mean that none of what you just shared with us actually exists in writing? Well, our, there are personnel procedures that exist in writing, but the fact that I told my department directors to, I mean, there there may be some emails that went, that, uh, that went back and forth. We were meeting with our directors. We had director meetings three times a week, um, and uh, we were talking uh, quite a bit, and we were moving quickly, and we were, you know, in the interest of protecting people. Uh, and uh, so I... I mean, there's not a PowerPoint uh, presentation that we prepared. Um, I know that, uh, you know, obviously we came up with um, our state of emergency personnel categories that um, were presented to the uh, Civil Service Commission that ensured that all of our employees were, were going to continue to be paid and receive their benefits regardless of what their status was during the, this pandemic. So you know, things like that were written and uh, and and uh, memorialized. But a simple request for from me to the directors to to uh, telework, maximize telework. We just it just it wasn't necessary to get that job done. Um, I. I think it, I understand that so many things are fast moving and we've got a lot of capacity restraints, but I think that. Um, I think county employees um, across departments um, and, and also certainly from the council would really um, benefit by having some things that are in writing. I mean, if that's, you know, if that means pulling together emails and other documentation, I mean, I don't, I'm not expecting a fancy PowerPoint, but I think it would be helpful to have one common item that everyone can refer back to as we, as we continue. And I, I just to just to add to that, it would be really helpful for us in oversight to get a sense of what costs associated with keeping our employees safe, what that looks like, um, some kind of budget related to all the things that you were talking about. Um, I think it makes sense to have a written plan for the comfort of the employees as well as some kind of documentation about costs for our oversight committee. Um, how much time do you think it would need for you to get together with your directors and come up with a at least a draft of a plan um, and some associated costs? I can work with uh, our admin department and see what they have on that. I, that we, they probably have that information on the top of uh, Paul's head right now. He he may be tracking that, but I'd have to defer to Sue on that. Well, and I will just say that you know county employees have been kept. You know, I have sent emails. Of course, we sent emails at the beginning about the SOE uh, pay structure, as well as uh, on May 31st when we transitioned to the uh, FFCRA guidelines. Uh, but 
really all county employees are either working from home or they're working you know in a, in a county facility we don't have any employees that um at least in the merit system that are not working uh now i think there was a couple days over in the courthouse when they had an outbreak but other than that i mean it's kind i mean it's not of course it's not business as usual but county employees i think uh, are clear about if they if they have a covid related uh, incident and they can't come to work what they need to do uh, but um, I can work with Mike and maybe kind of put those policies together well, madam chair yes councilwoman days thank you and thank you madam chair for that the the, the purpose of that is so that one department is not doing something differently than another department and I think when you don't have something that is concrete and in writing, you risk that disparity. Well, we had working plans, Chair, Chairwoman. We, we had working plans. We did not have working plans that were necessarily promulgated to all of our employees. Um, our personnel director handled communications with that in addition to the directors and the supervisors in each department. Um, th this was not this was not um, this was not something that was ill-conceived or thrown together quickly. There was a lot of discussion. There were working papers, and we can cobble together those working papers and share those with the council. Um, there, it, it's it, it, maybe I misspoke. But, you know, things were put in writing, but all of that was not. Uh, forwarded to our, um, oh, in addition to that, we also had executive orders and DPH orders that we were working from. So not all of that um, in that fine granularity was transmitted to our employees, um, but they were kept well informed by our personnel office and our supervisory staff. Again, uh, as I, may I finish my statement here, my interest is in the fact that we have consistency across the board in all departments. And I do know that I have received email at, emails uh, from various employees and, and, and uh, they're, they're saying that that is not the case. So if we have something that we can say, this is a policy, this is how we're going to operate, this is how the PPE is going to work. That's my interest. So I thank you, Madam Chairs, for uh, for reiterating uh, that fact, and hopefully we can get something very shortly so that the comfort level in the employees will be better. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Mike or his team? All right. Thank you. Um, I'll. I'll, I'll I'll circle back with you later uh, about the plan and how it's coming along and if we can get you any additional information. Okay, Cora, I believe it's time to hear from you. Catch us up on everything that's been going on the past few weeks. Okay, great. Good morning, uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I'm going to attempt to share my uh, PowerPoint with everyone. Again, uh, good morning, uh, Cora Faith Walker, Director of Policy for St. Louis County Executive Dr. Sam Page. And um, I'm gonna just go jump right into uh, some of the program updates that I wanted to highlight for you all. Um, as uh, the chairwoman said, it's been a couple of weeks and so there's certainly have been uh, several developments. Um, first, again, I just wanna make sure, uh, just kind of ground us in, in numbers and, and where we are in terms of the, the virus. So these were the numbers, uh, when we met a couple of weeks ago. And uh, as you all know, uh, you know, the numbers continue to um, rise and this continues to be a public health challenge that, that we are, an ongoing challenge that we are addressing. Um, kind of to that end, there, there have been several, several um, developments that have occurred. Yesterday, Dr. Page announced the awarding of approximately $2 million to Washington University in St. Louis for uh, to, to conduct a prevalence investigation where a sample size of about 5,000 residents in St. Louis County are going to be surveyed and um, have an opportunity to receive uh, free testing. Uh, the 
goal of this is really to try to determine just the number of folks in St. Louis County who really have had COVID kind of compared to how many might have been tested, um, really get an understanding of the impact of COVID-19 on hence their health, their mental health, their well-being, um, identify disparities and address those uh, specifically racial disparities um, around COVID-19. Figure out what sort of risk factors are associated with COVID and the complications uh, within COVID, specifically here and around St. Louis County, and then ultimately uh, use this information to continue to fine tune our strategies around uh, prevention and mitigation regarding the virus. Um, the study is, uh, participants in the study are also going to be able to get uh, transportation if necessary to go get tested uh, for free. And uh, folks that are determined or uh, determined to have tested positive will also receive some equipment, a thermometer, a pulse oximeter um, that, you, that one can use to monitor their oxygen levels in the blood, um, face masks and hand sanitizers really with the goal of, of trying to prevent the spread of in, um, the infection to other folks. And ultimately this project data is gonna just really, again, just help the Department of Public Health um, help inform their decisions uh, regarding the ongoing uh, pandemic. Let's see how I get this to advance. Okay, great. Um, additionally, since we last met, uh, there have been contracts that have been awarded to our partners that are federally qualified health centers um, in St. Louis County specifically with the goal of increasing uh, testing capacity and access to testing in North County, in the North County area. Um, just as a reminder, two and a half million dollars from the CARES funding uh, was allocated to this specific focus or initiative. And so far, uh, there have been two FQHCs um, who have been awarded contracts for testing. That's People's Health Center and then uh, Care STL. Affinia has also submitted a request um, or an application uh, for testing um, as of yesterday. So that's still pending uh, for about uh, $200,000. And so again, um, you know, fellow qualified health centers are and, and continue to be strong partners in the COVID-19 response. And so we are continuing to move forward with um, that partnership, really, again, with the goal of trying to increase testing uh, access and capacity um, in, in the areas of, of most need. So the community and mental health grant uh, portion of the public health response continues to move forward as well. Again, as a reminder, seven and about $7 million, uh, $7 million total was allocated for this specific portion of, of the, our response. Uh, just as a little bit of a breakdown, $2 million specifically, we're gonna go to health care services, another 2 million in mental health services. Uh, 1.5 to COVID-19 testing, a million to uh, just a uh, healthcare emergency fund, and then 500,000 uh, for PPE um, and other supplies and materials. Uh, so far, or at this point, uh, DPH has received a total of 26 applications um, who are requesting funding in the amount of one point, or I'm sorry, $8.15 million. And so that um, continues to move forward in the review process right now. Uh, just wanted to also highlight and point out that this process was uh, a participatory um, process that certainly involved the community who submitted surveys to indicate kind of where the money should go, which is how we broke down uh, that $7 million. 
And um, now that the applications from the different organizations have been submitted, the review process continues. And, and that is something else that is uh, participatory in nature um, and certainly involves the community um, and, and uh, their perspectives and review. Um, one other important uh, update that I just wanted to, um, that the Department of Public Health and really we just wanted to make sure to highlight uh, relates to the reporting system that um, exists. So Missouri has uh, recently rolled out um, a new reporting system. And so there, there remains um, uh, some transition that has to happen as that, as that um, moves forward. And uh, the Department of Public Health has also moved their full caseload to um, a system that that they custom built, the Red Cap system. Uh, and so they're they're continuing to just work through the interoperability between the Missouri State system and the the custom built system that's here in St. Louis County. And then uh, finally, masks and testing supplies. Um, there continues to be a need uh, for those. Um, there also continues to be a need for uh, a diverse kind of wide array of, of different vendors to make sure that the supply chain um, um, is sufficient. And so the Department of Public Health has invitations to bid out for more masks um, and anticipate launching another round of bids um, for testing supplies and materials, again, to really make sure that we are engaging multiple vendors um, who can ensure a sufficient supply chain. So those are the broad public health updates. I will pause before moving to the next section to answer any questions. All right, uh, Madam Chair. Council Moment Days. Uh, go, would you go back to the uh, the investigation, the Washington Uni University? Yes. Um, um, where is that? So they're going to be doing some kind of a survey. How are the five thousand people going to be selected? I think it's a random sampling. So we're just going to, um, based on what? Uh, are we going to do so many in each council district? Well, how, how is it going to work? I don't think that's going to be uh, limited to council district. It's going to be St. Louis County wide random sampling is my understanding. And um, Spring, if you're on and, and want to jump in um, if, and say anything more to, about that. Sure. Uh, There's, it's, it's actually, uh, they will do a, a mathematical representation of all of the demographics of the county. So they have to sample enough people in order to um, give us a good representation of the age, um, the race breakdown, the geographic breakdown, the gender breakdown of the county. So the results of the, they have to continue to test until they test enough people randomly to represent the diversity and breadth of our county population. So I just want to make sure I have this correct. So you will continue to ask people to participate until you get a, a representative sample from all the areas. Is, is that what you're telling me? That's correct. Okay, all right. All right, all right. When, while you're on here, Spring, talk about your mental health. Have we, have we uh, let those uh, contracts out to the mental health providers uh, at, at yet? We have $2 million allocated for that. So where are we with that, that program, that process? That's the participatory budgeting that um, uh, Cora was just talking about. So all those applications are in and the community members are reviewing them right now to score which, um, which organizations they wanna see funded. So we don't have at this particular point, mental health providers that have been funded. Uh, not by CARES Act um, from us. There are yeah, some CARES additional- CARES Act is what, I'm, is what I'm really interested in right now because that's what we're talking about. So, so the mental health, um, the mental health people, if you will, organizations, that, that's what I'm asking about now. So they have not been selected. They haven't really done uh, anything to this point yet. 
There have been additional funds that were awarded by the state and some others, but our funding is part of this $7 million that um, we covered on the, the screen that you see here. So the $2 million, again, I just want to make sure I'm clear. I, I want to make sure. So the $2 million that we have allocated for organizations that do, do mental health services have not received anything yet from our CARES Act money. That's correct, along with the other five million in, in primary care. I, I just want to check on the mental health because that has been a key point for a lot of people here. And we, we you know, this is something that you can't really hold off. And so the accuracy of the information that we're receiving, you're pretty, uh, you're pretty confident that um, that we can get this cross section of people, and we're just not having a um, a group of people from Central Corridor or West County or something, and they're the only ones that are uh, participating in this. No, it is a requirement of the grant that they create and test a representative sample, and they have to show all of the details behind that and the results will have to be representative of the county. Okay, um, we, do we have commit, commit community members as part of this? You you did say that this was a participatory budgeting, right? And that, so it, are those are those community members that are part of this or the, the are just uh, providers? So uh, there's two different things there. There's one that is community members are doing the participatory budgeting for the $7 million for services. Then there is the $2 million that was awarded to WashU. There is also community voices that are participating in that process as well. Um, they have FQHCs participating. Um, there is an organizing structure that has been created by um, the integrated health network with participation from the regional health commission and others where they are directly involving community members in that study design as well. So we include community voices in, um, in, in each of these pieces. And how were they selected? So that part was organized through um, the participation of the integrated health network. And so um, I am not familiar with that that piece like directly as part of that voice, but the integrated health network in the RHC, the regional health commission have both been um, a, a really engaged community members as a normal part of their function and work for um, for a long time. It's a it's a core principle of how they operate. Hmm. Okay, I might have to come back to that one. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. You're welcome. Any other questions before we move on? All right. Okay, so um, just moving on to give updates about the uh, humanitarian um, awards um, and, and that that part of the uh, our response. Um, we are nearing the end of the um, contract period for the organizations um, listed here who were originally awarded funds to address food security for 12, um, approximately 12 weeks um, in, in St. Louis County. Um, and so this is information um, just based on the most recently submitted reports from these organizations, um, St. Louis Area Food Bank, Operation Food Search, Pot Bangers, Urban League, and the Link Market, um, as well as the their uh, reports about the numbers of meals that have been served, um, expenditures, and and so on and so forth. Um, as these contracts begin to um, to expire, we have been discussing um, and, and, and considering another round of, of funding and support to address food security, especially as um, school, the, the situation around schools continues to change and um, many uh, schools, uh, you know, or many if not all of them at this point, um, move to uh, or, or move, school districts are moving to some sort of a virtual or virtual or hybrid sort of an option, um, you know, really recognizing that food security is going to remain a challenge 
for, for, for many folks. And so we have been in communication with these providers um, to really identify what their experience, you know, and, and learn from their experiences so far, you know, figure out what some of the their challenges were, um, any sort of uh, barriers or obstacles and, and, and how we can um, improve our processes um, internally um, and, and our approach moving forward if we decide or determine um, to, to provide additional support and funding for schools. We have at this point um, received a couple of, um, we've worked with Jason Purnell and the regional response team, as well as the Missouri Foundation for Health and some others to, again, um, kind of take an assessment or a survey of the need moving forward um, for the, the remainder of 2020. And um, have also heard from, from these providers, um, from, from, these, from those agencies and organizations about their experiences and thoughts about how this can be done in an equitable sort of fashion. And so we continue to work through that. Um, right now, the request from them is about, uh, from, from, for the next round of funding, it's not going to be all of these organizations. Um, we haven't made a determination yet, but just to kind of give you an idea of what the need is, uh, Based on our conversations, we've heard um, anywhere from 3.5 million to $4 million um, in additional funding support could help area organizations that work on food security um, address and provide meals to families and, and people in St. Louis County um, really in an equitable sort of a fashion. And so again, um, we're, we're just kind of continuing to to work through and fine tune that process a little bit. Um, like I said, I, we really wanted to make sure to hear from folks who've been doing this for the past 12 weeks and hear what their experiences were to help inform how we're going to move forward for the next round. I have, um, and part of their reporting, and I didn't include it in this, but I will be sure to send it to the um, oversight committee. And um, we've got information about all of the different zip codes that um, in, in which, uh, that were served um, by each of these different organizations. And so I will be sure to make uh, that information available to the committee. Additionally, uh, since we last met, uh, the humanitarian, overall humanitarian relief program um, continues to move forward. Uh, just as a reminder, that was a, that $9.5 million that was allocated for housing stabilization and homeless prevention, seniors and homebound uh, services to individuals social and emotional well-being of children. Um, and to your point earlier, Senator Days, while um, this isn't the specific mental health funding that was allocated or set aside um, in the public health tranche, uh, this certainly has a, a very strong mental health component to it, and it's but it's narrowly focused on children and really kind of supporting um, training for child care providers um, and really uh, helping develop the workforce so that they can make sure to support the social and emotional uh, well-being of, of children. And then finally, uh, technology. And so those, those uh, contracts have all been, um, have all been issued and, uh, and, and there is actually going to be uh, training uh, later on this afternoon about billing and compliance for all of the different agencies and organizations. And I just wanted to um, point or just bring to your attention that a list of all of the different organizations. Am I sharing my screen? Let me just try this. Uh, I think I see a little bit of a something. That's, yes, okay. So a list of all of the organizations that received funding as well as um, their contact information is available online um, on the STL Corona website. So I just wanted to point that out to, to you all. Um, just we, we've obviously already sent the list to everyone, but just to uh, point that out or highlight that for you all as well. So um, the next 
sort of development as, as again, as we're continuing to move forward is around the child care relief program. Um, that, again, as a reminder, $5.9 million uh, was allocated to that specific program uh, based on our communications and, and conversations with uh, child care providers in the community. $1.8 million was awarded to uh, the child care providers um, that had applied. Uh, and uh, staff and, and the team continues to finalize uh, a document a review and collection. Um, and then funding agreements are going to be expected to be issued uh, by next week, um, again, with the expectation, understanding that or the expectation that uh, the providers get all the documentation um, in as necessary and, and that it looks like that's that's moving along quite uh, moving along. Um, the providers are going to be issued one full amount um, for the entire amount um, once the funding agreements go out. Um, it's not going to be dispersed over time. That will be whatever was allocated for that specific provider. And then they will be uh, required to submit an interim report and then a final report. Uh, but again, the goal is really to just to try to get the money out as soon as possible um, and as quickly as possible. Uh, but we're just working through getting the final documentation that's necessary uh, in from, from the providers who applied um, to participate in the program. And there will be uh, webinars again for billing um, compliance training and technical assistance this Thursday and this Saturday. Since we last met, there were two other initiatives that um, were launched in the humanitarian uh, relief tranche. Um, one or the first is domestic violence and a response around domestic violence. So um, just based on some of our conversations that we have had with folks in the community, as well as um, with uh, our Director of Human Services, Andrea uh, Jackson Jennings, who, who um, oversees the Wyman Shelter, which is St. Louis County's domestic violence shelter, and some of the other sort of providers that work in the area, we, we, re we realize and recognize that domestic violence was certainly something that needed to be uh, addressed and um, we needed to invest in, in work around COVID and domestic violence. And so $1 million was allocated uh, for these four kind of specific goals of a program of increasing uh, just overall just health protection. So um, really just making sure that domestic violence uh, shelters, uh, domestic, domestic violence support providers uh, have the um, equipment, any sort of uh, PP, those sorts of things that are needed to make sure that the shelters are um, safe. One of the things that we've heard from folks is that uh, they're might be a lot some people who are reluctant or nervous about even um, calling because they're worried about going to a shelter that might have some sort of an outbreak. So that's one of the things we're approaching or, or trying to address with the $1 million. Um, as well as ensuring uh, just continuity of services through technology and really telehealth. So um, there are some agencies that have launched a sort of a web chat application um, so that people who might be in situations where they can't necessarily pick up a phone and call a hotline can still reach and 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 contact uh, domestic violence uh, uh, or agencies that, that deal with domestic violence and get the support that they might need. Um, and then also just overall prevention and then raising public awareness, just helping people uh, understand what sort of resources are available and what sort of options are available. The applications for that um, for, for that specific program uh, were due yesterday and uh, thus far, just based on um, what we've received uh, since that deadline of yesterday, uh, there have been 13, 000, I'm sorry, 13 applications that have been submitted uh, requesting a total of 
a uh, little one point about one point nine million dollars. So um, we're going to continue to move forward with the review process uh, for those applications. And then finally, uh, the digital equity initiative. So is that the last meeting? Uh, that uh, Chairwoman uh, Dunaway announced that uh, $4 million was going to be uh, allocated for technology, um, some sort of technology support for students um, and schools who were considering or moving to a uh, virtual learning option. And so um, in a really wonderful sort of partnership with the library, uh, this $4 million will be able to provide uh, subscriptions uh, at tutor.com for every single student in St. Louis County who would choose to participate and apply, or and, and who would choose to participate, uh, 2,500 Chromebooks, and then uh, 10,000 hotspots um, and the subscriptions for the hotspots to deal with uh, connectivity issues and um, just overall internet uh, access to uh, broadband internet. And so the applications for that program was due yesterday as well. Um, and so far, just based on what has been submitted, uh, 46 different school districts uh, submitted applications um, to this program. Uh, 22 of the public school districts um, of the 23 applied. Uh, Afton was the only one that did not apply. Uh, part of the application uh, was about just um, where, where the need exists. And I guess Afton school district's uh, perspective uh, was that, uh, that they, they did not participate or they didn't apply. Um, but then we've also, we, we didn't limit it or the program was not limited to uh, just public school districts, uh, private, parochial, independent schools were also able to apply, but um, had to submit some information about um, any sort of uh, what the percentage or population of their uh, students, uh, their student population that might be on some sort of needs-based scholarship or something like that. Because again, we're really trying to figure out um, where the need is and, and get the hotspots to, to the areas that are needed. Um, based on those 46 different uh, submissions, uh, there was a request for a total of 9,859 hotspots. So uh, that those 10,000 hotspots that um, are in the process of being procured uh, right now um, will be able to provide internet access um, and broadband internet access to uh, every student in St. Louis County that needs it uh, based on the responses that we've received from the school districts in the area. Uh, the amount of Chromebooks, though, um, and the request for Chromebooks uh, far outs, far exceeded um, the 2,500 that had been uh, allocated or, or determined it's, or budgeted for. And so uh, we are going to be meeting um, the library and uh, the, the humanitarian team will be meeting to figure out how to move forward. Um, and kind of in light of, of that, just, you know, that disparity in, in what was budgeted for and then what the apparent, uh, the apparent need is in the community. So that, those are the major humanitarian updates. I will, again, stop there um, to answer any questions. Councilwoman Day. Okay, if you go back to the child care relief program, yes. um, can you tell me the zip codes where the, the awards, you have 1.8 award, which is a, uh, a significantly less amount than you have al uh, allocated for Absolutely. that. Do you have the zip codes in, uh, of those of those facilities? Do you yes, I can. That information? I, I can certainly get that for you. Yes. I would like to get that. Again, I'm getting email uh, from uh, providers that they have not had or they have applied and they have not heard anything. So I want to be able to at least suggest to them that yes, they received your application. And I'm assuming you're doing in-house assistance with these folks, uh, 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 contrary to how we did the small business. I think we sent that information out. So is all, uh, uh, is all of this going to be in-house uh, assistance that you're giving and, and making the determinations in-house? 
So just um, as a reminder with this one, uh, this is pretty much a, a, an, an, an entitlement. Um, if, if a child care provider applied and submitted the necessary documentation, then they would receive an award based on the um, the size, their size, so the number of uh, of kid kiddos that they see, and so um, so it is. Uh, I, I would I would I would say it is certainly um, the the number the the sort of additional steps that have to happen uh, for for verifying the documentation, um, the sort of outreach that has to occur uh, with these providers um, and, and in this program. Is, is a lot uh, less complicated than the small business relief program, I would say. Um, however, uh, there still was a lot of outreach and remains, you know, some, some continuing uh, outreach that has to happen to get the documentation in, just because of the nature of, of many of the providers um, and the fact that many of them actually are uh, small businesses similar to, to uh, other uh, small businesses that participated participated in the SBR program, but uh, that is all. There, there is certainly um, the Children's Services Fund, the Department of Human Services has been work, and the Department of Human Services has been working with uh, our team as well as the partnership um, to just work through uh, getting these applications processed and the money out the door. Okay. That, okay. I'm not quite sure if that. Yeah, I, I guess. Uh, oh, so yeah. If we go down, and I wanted you to know that, and maybe I did not print the correct one, but, you know, the information that you have on the side of yours, uh, yes. I, that was not, I did not get yes. so, that. So was that a subsequent uh, PowerPoint that you sent out? Oh, yeah. So these, these are my notes, but I, I has been, um, it's been, uh, it's been submitted. I've, I've already submitted it to Diane. And so um, this this is OK. OK, because that kind of helped me as I was sure. reading this. I couldn't have I'm formulated sure. questions. But again, that that's fine. I can do that later. So and you talked about your domestic violence um, uh, program here. Now, how are you how are you getting the information uh, to the public? How, how are you? Uh, uh, raising that public awareness, as you're saying here, about what is um, uh, what is available, because I will I will say that I in my con some of my conversations, uh, some folks don't necessarily have the wherewithal to get this information website or uh, you know on that. So so what what methods are you utilizing to kind of get this information out? Yeah, thank you. That's a, that's a very very good question, and um, the fact is. We're not what, what this was is we um, we allocated one million dollars to for organizations to apply to do each of these different goals, and so our thoughts really were that like the actual organizations that work in the space of domestic violence um, that have the experience and the expertise um, um, in working in that space and in that area would be be best equipped to figure out where the gaps exist between what the public knows about what sort of uh, resources are available um, and them accessing those resources. And so uh, organizations applied to be able to, um, and part of the application, or some of those organizations applied to help raise public awareness of available okay. resources so that so that it's not necessarily your your team yeah. that's doing that it's it's you're giving it to the organizations and they're doing that correct okay so we thought they're, they're they're the best they're the best okay. I, I, and i do know that we had some questions earlier about the utilization of um of a uh, hotels in case there's some kind of emergencies are those hotels being utilized for domestic violence uh, um, uh folks who need that immediate relief are we, are we utilizing those hotels spaces for any of that? Do you know? So I, I don't believe we as St. Louis County are right now. However, DHS, it's my understanding that DHS is and has been working with some other agencies and organizations who um, that's what their model and that's what their approach is. Um, and so again, just as part of uh, the applications that have come in, um, and we haven't looked at them all yet, but some of the agencies 
likely applied for funding or the organizations likely applied for funding to be able to um, provide hotels to those um, to, to clients that they serve um, as needed. Uh, that is certainly one of the models that some under, of them have. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to mean to interrupt. But we already yes. have some of those under contract. Um, we we put those aside for uh, uh, first responders yes. and, and folks like that. So if there's space there, you know, I don't know if it's necessary that we go and, you know, rent some more hotels when we do have these under contract already. And that was my thought behind that. And and so and again we it, th th again it wouldn't be us that would be renting the hotels it would be you know the agencies that we um, that have applied and and for this money some of them their approach is to uh, place clients at a hotel and so if that's kind of what their that agency's model is then that um, then that would be part of whatever their application was. Um, we certainly do and and have uh, the hotel space that we've contracted with St. Louis County with directly available. However, um, just kind of again based on our conversations with uh, like actual providers that work in the space, um, the fact that the, the the location of the hotel is public knowledge. Um, makes so that may be an issue. a little bit trickier. Um, okay. So that's why okay. we wanted to make sure that the agencies um, who applied um, it, it might apply to put hope, you know, for hotel space in a different place. Okay. And as a general, uh, general observation, uh, Cora, I want to make sure that we utilize the offices of DEI when we're looking at many of these things. I, I think uh, we have we have systematically left them out when we're even looking at procurement kind of issues or or the uh, food relief. They certainly have an opportunity to be in the community and knowing where some of these gaps may exist. And so I would implore you to utilize the services of, of uh, DEI as, as we move forward with this process. I think that would, that would help you considerably in that. Department of Equity and Inclusion. I'm sorry, I did not mean to use the an acronym there. Thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you. Any, other, any Are there any other, other questions? That's the last one that I have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilwoman. Anyone else? Okay, economic rescue it is. Okay, so um, just to give you a couple of just really brief updates about that, um, the economic t rescue team continues to work and continues to move forward. Uh, they are going to be uh, conducting or they're going to be contracting with um, with uh, a company to, to conduct a small business survey um, to hear from small businesses in, in the in the area and in the community. Um, I, that survey uh, has been has been um, finalized. Uh, it was finalized last week. And uh, the ETC Institute is going to do kind of a pilot test of the survey um, and then mail it to folks um, and, and businesses in about a week and we'll get some preliminary results in September. So we'll really be able to hear from uh, the businesses uh, in, in the, in the, um, in the community. Uh, once we get that sort of pilot test from uh, ETC Institute, uh, back from from them, um, we will certainly be uh, happy to to share with with the with the council or the committee. Um, additionally, uh, the economic rescue team has submitted uh, recommendations uh, based on their analyses or analysis of um, existing rules, regulations, and ordinances in St. Louis County, and that they recommend um, be suspended temporarily to help uh, kind of remove some of the sort of existing barriers um, and obstacles that, that might exist for businesses and really to, small businesses and really to just kind of relieve some pressure. So um, we are continuing to kind of look at that and, and make some determinations about, uh, about what we could possibly um, consider suspending temporarily um, to just help small businesses or really just businesses in the area. 
Um, then the small business relief program, again, this, this, this is an update of where we are um, and, and the most uh, current numbers. Um, we are continuing to move forward with that, um, with this program. Uh, and we have also uh, engaged the partnership to uh, help in the processing of uh, the remaining applications that uh, have not yet been processed and really uh, taking advantage of uh, the, the expertise um, that the partnership has in, in working with uh, businesses and working with small businesses. And so um, we, at this point, um, there are approximately 1,088 applications that remain to be processed. Um, and the partnership has uh, indicated that there was set a goal of, of getting those applications processed uh, by the end of the month and getting the money out of the door uh, shortly thereafter. So we're, we're moving forward with that. Um, but many of the uh, responses that we have received uh, from, from folks who've gotten uh, the support so far um, have, have been very, very positive. Just, you know, there are businesses that are struggling right now. And so um, the money is, is certainly uh, something that is support supporting and helping those businesses. So um, I will stop now to answer any questions. Sure. <laughs> Councilwoman Days. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, let me just, first of all, Okay, my frustration with this, we have been dealing with the small business relief since March. If you are a small business and you are kind of looking to this to give you some kind of uh, relief, of, again, this is what it's supposed to do. From March to September is an exorbitantly long time for people to wait on their assistance. So if I'm looking at your, your chart here, we had in the in the first, we had 73 applications. And of the 73 applications, only 14 have been sent checks. And I'm I'm going across here. So I want to make sure I'm looking at your, your chart correctly. Yes, that that's right? correct. Okay, that's, that's correct. correct. And so now we're going to have we're going to be again in September uh to get, I guess, the rest of these. I have can't tell you how many people are just absolutely frustrated with the fact of how long it's taking to get this. I don't know where where we are with this, with the partnership. Was the partnership involved from the beginning to do this process? Um, so in origi originally uh, the program uh, was uh, internal in the county executive's uh, office and um, And that was, yeah, that was, it was originally internal in the county executive's office. Okay, I'm, I'm recalling a, uh, a accounting firm that, so that's not in the county executive <laughs> office. So yeah, initially sure. we had these folks to apply to a, uh, and their, their applications went to an accounting firm. Is that accounting firm still part of the process with the partnership? I, it's it, um, it's my understanding that most of the work from the accounting firm um, related to this program has concluded. Um, but I, I think there uh, might be some folks that are on um, that might be able to speak to that a little bit more. Um, well, um, let me just let me just finish my finish my questions first, and and I appreciate that because uh, uh, in my district, I had asked several times to get my own people, get my own applications so that I could look at these applications. Why were they, um, the number that were, were people applied, if they made it through the process, fine. If they did not, what was the, was the holdup in terms of them moving forward and receiving this money? And uh, Cora, I, I have not received it to this date 
that complete list of that. And that is very frustrating for me because people are calling me. They're asking me these questions and I don't have answers for them. That's not a good position for me to be in. And so I'm, I'm again, I'm just airing my frustration out to you and to whoever is on the call that needs to hear that. But these folks are going under because they're pro they've been promised some things and they have not received those. And so my question is, are we going to be able to get 73 applications that have been processed out of the door by September? I guess you said September 1. Yeah, so Councilwoman, this is Rodney Krim. Uh, you know, Hi, Rodney. How are you? Hey, how are you? And how, how's everybody else? If you want me to go video, I can go video uh, as well. But uh, whatever you prefer. Please do. We'd love to see your face, Rodney. <laughs> So I will stop. I will stop sharing my screen. Is, should I do that? I, I can still see as long as he turns on his camera. I can still see even with your oh, okay. slide up. There All he right. is. Can you guys see me now? So, uh, so as Cora said, uh, we've been involved for about uh, two to three weeks now, and so mm -hmm. we appreciate that the uh, county. Uh, asked us to participate and we're willing, very willing to participate because we know how beneficial this will be uh, and is already to uh, small businesses. So we got our team together. You know, our team has their regular day jobs, but we've asked people to carve out some time uh, to work on this program and they're very committed to it because that's what we do. We help, we help businesses. And so the uh, objective of helping uh, distribute this money to get through get through all the applications and distribute this money is very near and dear to our hearts and working in partnership uh, with the county team that's already been working uh, on this. So what we've tried to do is use the rules that were established from the beginning because we didn't want to confuse people by having different rules. And so we're trying to use the same rules, but then trying to uh, organize the process uh, in a way that we can get the monies out by the end of August. And so our, our objective is to get everything out, get all these applications out, uh, all these applications reviewed, completed, and the monies uh, out by the end of August. And so to do that, we have about 20 staff that have uh, carved out time to work on this. We've also engaged uh, a uh, some temporaries to work under our staff uh, to supplement the efforts of our staff so we can throw, uh, again, have more resources, more people resources uh, at this so that we can get this, uh, get this completed. Uh, there are a number of questions and uh, issues that are on the applications that we're working with the, the applicants to complete. Uh, they're very receptive to get the phone calls. A number of them have expressed lots of just thankful emotion that uh, this program exists and that, uh, you know, that they are getting the phone calls and that they are uh, in the process uh, leading to uh, getting the funds. So uh, as we go forward, uh, we hope that there's uh, less frustration. I know everybody's been working very hard on this program uh, and our uh, collective objective working with the with the county team the rest of the county team is to uh, make sure that this happens uh, before the end of august thank you rodney now we initially had uh, some kind of a call center is that call center still working uh, working with you uh, on this or you utilizing your own uh, folks you mentioned temporaries to do to you to do the calling back to these folks so we use our own employees our own employees who have carved out time uh, to call them directly because we've had some experience with our own small business resource program that we started at the beginning of the COVID uh, period. And so with that experience, we know that having that call is that, that that's that, that, that lifeline uh, to many of these businesses. Somebody cares, somebody's listening to them, uh, somebody's helping them 
kind of walk through those open questions uh, on the application. And so they're very, uh, our, our staff is very committed to doing that. And we're just supplementing our staff with, with uh, temporaries. We're not uh, assigning, uh, you know, this project to temporaries. We're just supplementing our staff because we feel like using the temporaries, they can answer, uh, we can, we have a kind of a script uh, that the counties uh, we shared with the county, the county shared with us, and we've kind of just all worked together to uh, enhance that a bit. And so uh, both our staff and the uh, temporaries are using that that script, but our staff is more experienced with these multiple issues that some of these applications have. And so our more seasoned staff are handling the more difficult ones and then having the temporaries handle the less difficult ones. Thank you very much for that. I um, um, th This gives me a, a little better sense of how this is going to work. I feel a little more comfortable now. And the fact that you've only been engaged for two to three weeks says says some things because this program has been going on since March. So I won't hold you responsible for what happened <laughs> from March. I'll just give you this, this last two to three weeks, okay? All right, no, that's fine. But we are all you, committed to, to, to getting this money out, so. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're so welcome. Are there any other questions on the Small Business Relief Program? All right, well, thank you, Rodney. All right, thank yes. you guys. Thank you, thank you so much, Rodney. Um, yeah, we're just we're very, very uh, grateful to the partnership for, for their uh, for their assistance. Um, so I I'm gonna uh, uh, get ready to wrap up here. I'm gonna just wanted to talk briefly about uh, the municipal reserve uh, or the the amount that we've got reserved for municipalities out uh, of 47 million. Um, and really, we are just continuing uh, our discussions with uh, municipal leaders, uh, other and, and other stakeholders and interested parties. Uh, we've been working with the Municipal League, um, the 24-1 Coalition, um, and, and some other in talks and discussions about, uh, about what sort of uh, relief um, or support St. Louis County uh, could provide uh, for, from our uh, CARES funding, our coronavirus relief funding. Um, really right now, <coughs> pardon me, um, right now what we're really working on and, and working to uh, try to come to some sort of a consensus about um, is the, uh, how the funding um, and the $47 million uh, could potentially be distributed to the different 88 municipalities. Um, as well as uh, St. Louis County directly. And so uh, the sort of, there are a couple of different approaches that um, have been proposed. One um, is a per capita sort of a, an approach that just bases the $47 million uh, amount that's uh, been set aside uh, the allocation to each municipality based on the population of that municipality. Um, Dr. Page uh, has certainly emphasized equity and, and sort of equitable responses throughout this public health crisis and approach and, and public health um, and our, our response rather. And so uh, similarly with, with this, we in St. Louis County um, and, and Dr. Page and, and in the office are proposing um, an equitable approach that really takes into account um, a multitude of factors, but would emphasize distributing funding to the areas of greatest need and the areas that are hardest hit. Um, a couple of uh, meetings ago, we discussed that formula uh, that we call the Harry 10 formula, which looks at 10 different variables related to both uh, health outcomes as well as certain economic factors and assigns a score to different municipalities based on that. But what we have seen um, just in that formula or using that formula 
is that when you that the amount of funding significantly shifts for um, the, muni- the municipalities that you that you might expect, the ones um, really in the North County area who um, have higher uh, incidences and, and, and cases of, of COVID um, who are just uh, just really just hardest hit and in, in the greatest need, um, but might not have the, you know, might not, might not have a large population. And so, uh, like I said, the, the sort of those discussions are really kind of ongoing. Um, we, we will likely, you know, end up with something in the middle between kind of, you know, just uh, a, a per capita sort of distribution and something else that uh, is uh, more equ- that is equity focused um, based on what our interpretations are um, of issues around equity. And so uh, the other thing that is happening right now, though, uh, is this negotiations and, and discussions on the federal level and uh, the next package of funding that um, that we anticipate coming from uh, the federal government. And so that's uh, something else that we're currently monitoring as well. But overall, just based on um, our research and what we have observed uh, and that $47 million that has been set aside right now for the municipalities uh, that accounts for 25 or so percent of the entire funding um, that St. Louis County received to date from uh, the federal government uh, for the, the CARES, the coronavirus relief funds uh, that St. Louis County received from the federal government. Uh, that is probably, uh, that $47 million is certainly um, a very healthy uh, amount um, and, and percentage uh, that we've got set aside uh, for the municipalities. Um, really compared to other jurisdictions that we've seen so far. So again, we're going to, you know, we're continuing those conversations and continuing to monitor what's happening at the federal level. And um, we will certainly have more uh, updates and information in a couple of weeks. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, Madam Chair. Yes, Councilwoman Days. Okay, I didn't know if I was on mute. Okay, it was Mr. Chair, I guess this is the opportunity for me to uh, weigh in on uh, what we have been discussing for several weeks now, looking at the municipalities and what their challenges are now and will be past this COVID. That has been a concern of mine from the very beginning. I have forwarded to you and I believe to Cora, I'm not sure, a sort of a resilient plan, a resilient recovery for our municipalities that takes in the holistic approach of the municipalities, not just necessary public safety or or pigeonhole, but the but the municipality as a whole. And and because we know that the health of these of these municipalities, the 88 that we have is really in jeopardy. Uh, Many of these and many of the ones that I represent are part of a pool city. And we know that the, 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 the sales tax revenue has been down almost 50%. And so that is something that I think we need to deal with and we need to start that process now rather than later. Um, and so with that, I have proposed an $800,000 $800, request uh, from this committee to get a process started to look at individual municipalities, what their challenges are, what kinds of things they can do to stabilize them even now, but even past COVID, because the money will run out uh, December 31st. And at past that point, what is what is the plan for us to do? So at this point, this is my request uh, from, the, um, from the oversight committee. This will simply be a starting point a gathering of data that we're looking at the engagement of the municipalities and putting together a strategic plan uh, to facilitate this process. So that, Madam Chair, is um, my uh, request in a nutshell. And, you know, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to do that. But we've sent out several um, several um, proposals to you uh, for this. And so I at this particular point would 
you know, hear questions or concerns or whatever you have at this particular point? Um, so initially, um, I have lots of questions. I have questions for Cora. I have questions for you. Um, but the first question I have and that I'd like to ask if Cora even knows, I, I know you've been meeting with some of the um, the municipal government um, mayors and uh, city administrators. How did they come to this number? What is it that they are trying to do with the $47 million? And are we, this is a two-part question, so I don't know how you want to deal with this. Are we looking at creating some type of a grant process that they can apply and let us know what they want? And if so, can Councilwoman Days's uh, interest in a more holistic look and how the municipalities are planning to thrive after this, can that all be a part of the same process? That is a long, big, multi-part so, question. So there, there were th I'm sorry. There's three questions, yes. it sounds like. Um, so how did the Municipal League um, who submitted the $47 million request come to that number? Is that that was one? Um, yes. The second was about um, kind of the structure uh, of the of this approach and whether or not it will be a grant approach that would require the municipalities to submit applications. And then the third was, as part of those applications, could we incorporate some of uh, Councilwoman Days's. plan that wants to look at and determine kind of the the, uh, the, the viability or the solvency, if you will, of, of municipalities, right? Yeah. Okay, great. So uh, um, the answer to your first question is, is um, I, I honestly am not entirely sure. Um, again, it was a, it was a per capita um, uh, sort of an uh, uh, allocation that that that's one of the ones that have been proposed um but i'm, I'm not entirely sure uh where the number um came from off the top of my head and i, and I don't want to um speak but i can certainly get that information i'm sure i'm sure we've discussed it before but i, I just um i i want to want to be accurate about uh all of the different factors that went into that so i i will i can and will follow up with the committee with that information and then uh regarding the the I'd say you know, the second question and the, and the sub part of that question, um, I mean, absolutely, I, I think that uh, an application process um, uh, makes a lot of sense. You know, we, we certainly uh, have heard what members of this committee have 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 stated and suggested um, just about this and in response to this um, and, and really having that desire to get that information to, to have um, the municipalities really kind of explain what the plans are and kind of what their plans are for moving forward. And so, um, you know, I, I think that there's certainly a possibility um, and, and really an ability to, to include and incorporate uh, both of those things um, in, in the determining or the allocation of, of uh, the funding. How much of the study that's being done by WashU could potentially provide the answer, some of the same answers that Councilwoman Days is seeking in her request? Can we get more information on that too? I, I don't want to have redundant processes or spend duplicative efforts and monies um, if we can, you know, combine forces and, and get some of this squared away together. So when you, the study by WashU, do you mean the, the, the prevalence investigation? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, so so uh, that's a good question. And, and that's something that uh, we really hadn't considered. Um, you know, many of the, so the, uh, the health variables that went into the uh, equitable approach that has been developed that uh, uses that kind of HERI 10 model that uh, Molly Metzger uh, worked on and, and, and developed, looks at things like 
asthma, diabetes, uh, uh, premature deaths, those sorts of things. And, and basically the point is that there is a very, very, very strong correlation between kind of those variables and where we've seen some of the highest numbers of COVID. And so the point that I'm making is that we really don't have to wait um, for that prevalent study from WashU to be done in order to really account for and, and be able to pinpoint um, the sorts of municipalities in the area of, of St. Louis County that really do have the most need. But that's certainly something that we can, can, can discuss further. Yeah, and I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, Councilwoman Days, I think what you're looking for and what we would like to also see, what I, I mean, at least what I would like to see on behalf of the committee is, you know, we, we've got this Municipal League request, but what is going to, what plan is a municipal municipality putting in place to exist and thrive beyond this crisis? You know, are, are we just slapping on a Band-Aid for, to a broken leg or, you know, something worse? And, and how are we ensuring that the municipalities have a plan and will be able to, to move beyond this crisis if we can help them float through it? Does that make sense? It, it is exactly uh, what, you, what you're saying, because that is why you would have to have a strategic plan for moving forward on this. Uh, the wash you in in my what I'm understanding from Cora is that um, is that um, we're looking to uh, do the wash you with with kind of health outcomes. You're only going to have five thousand people in this. Well, I know that I represent forty munis, and I'm not sure what uh, uh, the number that uh, that you represent or Council uh, Woman Gray. But looking at the viability, the sustainability, and the stability of all of these, because at the end of the day, these people are going to be under some governmental structure. And is, is it St. Louis County's opinion that it can absorb these um, governmental structures within its body? Or do we help them uh, to stand on their own and be successful on their own. And that's why I'm thinking that we have to have a plan put together for that specifically. So. Yeah, is this something, Cora, that maybe we can work on um, for the next couple of weeks and be able to have, at least at our next meeting in two weeks, be able to um, sort of show we've made some progress here, maybe we're closer to an application process or a study so that we can answer these questions. Yes, I mean, yeah, I, I, I certainly, um, yeah, we can we can certainly uh, do that in two weeks. Um, we, we have a lot of, uh, a lot of the work has been done already and, and we certainly have, uh, uh, have ideas about, um, all of the all many of these different components that were just raised um again it, it's it's really kind of just trying to come to some sort of decision about which approach we're going to take and so um we can certainly talk more about it uh um at the next oversight committee meeting uh one thing that i will add uh that i think is, is really important I, I kind of mentioned it in passing about us really just observing what's going on at the federal level um, with this next this next uh, stimulus package, if you will, um, that at least right now um, is still being worked out, uh, is that there has been um, really from from local and state governments throughout the country a real sort of a request um, and and advocating for uh, to the our, you know to Congress and and uh, the Senate about this next package of um, really kind of having more flexibility for what the coronavirus relief fund monies can be used for. Um, so as you all know, we're likely you know remember the current package and the current monies um, are, are pretty, pretty uh, 
limited and, and restricted and are pretty boxed in. Um, um, and so one of the things that we have heard and, and we have advocated for St. Louis County, um, but then also many of the other communities um, and, and local and state governments from around the country have advocated for with a lot more flexibility um, when that next round of funding comes out. So it might not end, you know, at the end of this year, uh, that, that sort of thing. The other thing that I, and then kind of as part of that, where we are right now, our understanding is kind of the starting point for the negotiations as that moves forward is uh, at about a hundred billion to $150 billion. And so I just wanted to uh, remind everyone that that was the end point for, um, for the first round of coronavirus relief funds that, that, um, that were, were issued to, uh, to states and local governments with more than 500,000 uh, people. So um, we feel, um, and, and we've been, our, our, our um, consultants and, and the folks that, we, that, that, we, uh, that work with St. Louis County um, in Washington, D.C. and in the federal government um, have, you know, we, we feel uh, confident that there is going to be another round of funding. Um, there is the goal to have increased flexibility for local and state governments with that other round of funding. And it looks like it's going to be at least what we received or what was um, allocated or issued uh, in the first round. And so all of those different factors and components will ultimately determine, you know, what, what the plan might look like and what the strategy might look like. And so I think it does make sense for us to maybe re come back in a couple of weeks and hopefully we'll have a better idea of what's going to be going on at the federal level um, and then kind of how we need to proceed from there. So, yes, I will be happy to, to come back in, uh, and, and have other folks come back in a couple of weeks to talk about that. And, uh, and Corey, if I may, that, uh, and, and thank you for that. I'm very willing to work with you on that. Uh, and, and please know that when when the request for SEP 47 million uh, from, from the munis, this, this clearly uh, could be from that money that we already have and need to utilize uh, before uh, December 31st. So I just want you to kind of keep that in mind that there is um, that uh, there is a, a, a carve out at this particular point because the 47 million was put in the budget. Uh, just in case we could do that, I, if I'm if I'm correct, I'm not sure if it's still there, but it was initially put in as part of the budget uh, to make sure that we did something on behalf of the municipalities, and that is what my goal is. So uh, when you start those conversations, I would really like to be part of that. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman Days. Um, are there any additional questions or comments before we move to the public comment? All right, Diane, I believe the floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chair. So this afternoon, um, regarding public comments, we received just resolutions from the following municipalities. I'm not going to read these resolutions today, but they will be attached to the committee report. Those resolutions were submitted by uh, Clayton, City of Clayton, City of De Pere, Florissant, Maplewood, Olivet, University City, and Vanita Park. In addition, we received resolutions and some public comments from various mayors and those I will read into the record. From William Hook, mayor of the city of Bel Nor. Thank you for providing this opportunity to request that this special committee give serious consideration to reimbursing small county municipalities such as ours, the city of Bel Nor, for public safety costs incurred during the ongoing COVID-19 health emergency. The city of Bel Nor is an inclusive, diverse part of the greater Normandy area with a rich history and a bright future. 
Since our founding in 1937, the village and now city of Belnor has been a special place in St. Louis County where neighbors become friends and multi-generational families come back to live, work, and worship like their parents and grandparents. We proudly support our professional first responders in the Bell Nor Police Department and wish to see the tradition of local community-based policing continue through this crisis period. Since the beginning of the CARES Act eligibility period, the city has incurred costs of approximately $138,000 in support of our public safety payroll. This includes overtime pay for officers and paid time off for COVID testing and screening. Thankfully, we have not experienced any cases of COVID-19 within our small police department. During the same time period, our officers and command staff supported surrounding municipalities with police protection for a peace rally, peaceful rally and march held in Normandy on June 7th. And our officers have responded to several mutual aid requests for assistance with serious crime incidents. Our city board of aldermen passed a resolution on May 20th, 2020, requesting that quote, if any portion of the $175 million in funding received by St. Louis County under the CARES Act is expended by the St. Louis County Executive as reimbursement for law enforcement expenses, including but not limited to payroll and benefits for the St. Louis County Police Department during the eligibility period, a proportional amount should be paid to the municipalities who provide the majority of law enforcement services to the citizens of St. Louis County. I hope this committee will give this request due consideration. Thank you for your time. Mayor Hook's comments will be included in the report and his attached resolution will also be attached. From the mayor of the city of Brentwood, David Dimmitt. St. Louis County received more than $170 million directly from the federal government as part of the CARES Act to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. The U.S. Treasury Department is responsible for issuing, issuing guidance on the use of these funds. Initially, the guidance was narrow and the funds had to be used for testing, public health, business loans, etc. Using funds to help stabilize local government finances due to the loss of revenue was not permitted initially. However, since then, President Trump instructed the Treasury Secretary to issue guidance allowing for the funds to be used to pay ongoing salaries of all public safety employees. Basically, the feds are saying that providing any police, fire, or EMS service during the COVID pandemic is considered responding to the event and is an, and is an permitted use of the funds. The guidance now says that funding can be used to meet payroll expenses for public safety, public health, health care, human services, and similar employees whose services are substantially dedicated to mitigating or responding to the COVID-19 public health emergency. St. Louis County has around $120 million in unencumbered CARES funding still available that must be spent by the end of 2020 or returned to the federal government. St. Louis County received these funds based on the county's population as a whole. Therefore, it would only seem fair that if the county chooses to use these funds to pay county PD, then the same logic should apply to municipal first responders as well. We all can agree that St. Louis County provides non-contracted law enforcement services only to the unincorporated areas of the county, or 32.15% of the county's total population. The remaining 67.85% of the residents of the county are served by municipal police departments or contracted law enforcement services paid for out of municipal funds. To date, the city of Brentwood has incurred public safety payroll costs for fire, emergency medical service, and law enforcement during the eligibility period in excess of $910,104.58 for payroll and related fringe benefit costs. All such costs are presumed by the U.S. Department of the Treasury to be COVID-related expenses during the eligibility period. I encourage you to support and provide a recommendation to the county executive and the county council to allocate these funds to municipal public safety departments because of the shutdown and the re resulting lost revenues to municipalities. We need your help now. And the mayor did submit a resolution that will be included with the report, committee report. From the city of Chesterfield, 
Mayor Bob Nation. As you are aware, Congress enacted the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, providing $2 trillion in economic relief for the purpose of providing assistance to American workers, families, and small businesses, to provide assistance to state and local governments, and to preserve jobs for American industry. The Department of the Treasury distributed these funds proportionally based on 2019 census data directly to local governments, including those cities and counties with a population greater than 500,000 and state governments. The state of Missouri received $2.3 billion from the CARES Act, a portion of which was subsequently distributed to Missouri counties proportionally based on population, except in St. Louis and Jackson counties, which received a direct payment from the U.S. Treasury under the CARES Act, along with a recommendation from the governor that those counties which had received funds directly from the state of Missouri would in turn distribute CARES Act funds to local governments located within their jurisdictions. St. Louis County received $173.5 million of this CARES funding directly from the Treasury. As of this date, no municipality in St. Louis County has received any CARES Act funds. The Department of the Treasury has issued eligibility guidelines for use of the CARES Act funds, which clearly provides payroll expenses for public safety as eligible reimbursable expenses. Municipalities within St. Louis County provide municipal law enforcement services for 67.85% of the residents in the county and have been severely impacted by economic losses associated with the pandemic. These municipalities are desperately in need of the CARES funding relief, which they are eligible to receive. The $173.5 million in CARES funding received by the county should justly be shared pro rata with municipalities based on their population in as much as all levels of government, including both county and municipal governments, are incurring COVID-related public safety expenses. On behalf of the City of Chesterfield and the county residents who reside therein, I strongly urge the Oversight Committee to endorse the just distribution of the $47.5 million CARES allocation previously reserved by County Executive Page to those municipalities who provide and have incurred expenses for municipal law enforcement on a pro rata population-based distribution. From the City of Hazelwood, Mayor or City Manager Matt Zimmerman. On behalf of the Mayor and City Council of the City of Hazelwood, I want to thank you for the additional efforts you and the entire County Council and Executive Dr. Sam Page have taken to protect our communities during the COVID-19 pandemic. The City is especially grateful for the provision of personal protective equipment the County has provided. As you know, Hazelwood, like all municipalities, have incurred significant additional expenses as a result of the pandemic. Additional overtime to provide police and fire staffing as employees are in self-quarantine are the largest expense. To date, the city has had eight police officers and one firefighter that have or were exposed to COVID-19, as well as a number of other city employees. All were required to self-quarantine until receiving a negative test or clearance from their doctor, including myself. As you are aware, the federal government has provided funding to cities and counties over 500,000 population under the CARES Act to, in part, offset increased costs. No municipality in St. Louis County is eligible for direct funding from the federal government. I'm asking the committee to consider utilizing the $47 million Dr. Page has set aside for pandemic-related costs borne by the cities in St. Louis County. This money is desperately needed, not only due to the additional cost, but also due to reduced revenues. For the April through June quarter, Hazelwood revenues were over $1.2 million less than the same period in 2019. Treasury Secretary Mnuchin has stated that the funding that was established to be used by state and local governmental entities to offset costs associated with the pandemic. I ask the committee to recommend at its August 11 meeting that the $47 million be distributed to the municipalities in St. Louis County at the earliest possible opportunity. Thank you for your consideration. I have attached a copy of Resolution 2002 adopted by the Hazelwood City Council on May 20th addressing this issue. Once again, I thank you for your efforts on behalf of the residents of Hazelwood and all of St. Louis County. 
and the city manager's resolution will be part of the record. From Mayor Michael Muller, City of Maryland Heights. As mayor of the City of Maryland Heights, I am writing this letter to express support for the equitable distribution of the $175 million in funding received by St. Louis County from the Coronavirus Aid, Relief and Economic Security Act, CARES Act, to municipalities for the reimbursement of public safety costs incurred to protect staff and residents from COVID-19. The City of Maryland Heights incurred sub substantial expenditures to secure personal protective equipment for police officers, cleaning supplies to disinfect patrol vehicles and police station services, and an ultraviolet light device to further clean vehicles and jail cells. The great majority, 67.85% of residents of the county are serviced by municipal police departments. These departments, including the Maryland Heights Police Department, perform a necessary and vital service to the region. If not for the services provided by municipal police departments, the county would be burdened by the need to provide manpower and resources to residents of these areas. Municipalities are asking that the county equitably and fairly share CARES Act funds to offset the costs of protecting police officers in the greater community from the spread of COVID-19. These are expenditures that are over and above the regular or normal level of services. They were unpredicted, unavoidable, and unbudgeted costs. Reimbursing municipalities for these expenditures reflects the purpose of the CARES Act funding released by the federal government, protecting our communities and ensuring that jurisdictions do not experience undue financial stress. Please consider my request. Municipalities deserve a share of funds equitable to the population size they serve. Please see the attached resolution. Please see the attached resolution passed by the Maryland Heights City Council on May 21st, 2020, exp expressing this request. And that resolution will be made part of the record. From the City of Maryland Heights City Administrator, Tracy Anderson. As City Administrator for the City of Maryland Heights, I am writing this letter to express support for the equitable distribution of the $175 million in funding received by St. Louis County from the Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Security Act to municipalities for the reimbursement of public safety costs incurred to protect staff and communities from COVID-19. And then looking at, oh, okay, it's not the same letter. Uh, the City of Maryland Heights has incurred substantial expenditures to secure personal protective equipment for police officers, cleaning supplies to disinfect patrol vehicles and police station services, and an ultraviolet light device to further clean vehicles and jail cells. Municipalities are asking that the county equitably and fairly share CARES Act funds to offset the costs of protecting police officers and the greater community from the spread of COVID-19. These are expenditures that are over and above the regular or normal level of services. They were unpredicted, unavoidable, and unbudgeted costs. Reimbursing municipalities for the expenditures reflects the purposes of the CARES Act funding released by the federal government, protecting our communities and in and ensuring that jurisdictions do not experience undue financial stress. Please consider my request. Municipalities deserve a share of funds equitable to the population size they serve. From Mayor Patricia Freebus in Sunset Hills. In reference to the proposed distributions of the CARES Act grant money, the city of Sunset Hills strongly supports the $47 million distribution for the municipalities based on our per capita basis for public safety payroll expenses. And our last uh, committee comment this afternoon is from Theotis Brown. This subject is referencing committee meeting of August 11th, 2020, quote by incumbent St. Louis County Township committee, committee man, Libertarian Central Committee, Sergeant at Arms Officer Theotis Ted Brown Sr. SF TWP PCT 32 of Home Township 9901 Lilac Drive, St. Louis, Missouri 62137. As the August primary race third party nominee elect for St. Louis County Executive Libertarian Ballot Winner and Law and Order Platform to Wit, hereby raise as point of order and point of law as legal connotation, the issues of OSHA 
29 CFR Part 1904 under Public Law 91-596 as applicable all establishments to wit as a OSHA regulation matter of law and question of law. My concern, example OSHA Form 300, issue for establishment guidelines, log of work-related injuries and illnesses. Sincerely, County Township Committeeman Theo Brown, Senior Chairman of the St. Louis uh, STLCC District. I'm not sure what that refers to. District Board of Trustees, Veteran Association founder, and as the one who won the 4-8-2014 Board of Trustees, six-year term seat on the State Junior College District of St. Louis, St. Louis County, multi-venue counties, political taxing district, legal site 178.862 RSMO. Madam Chair, that is all the public comments. Thank you so much. That brings us to the end of our agenda. And is there any, are there any final comments or questions from any committee members? Okay, great. I would certainly entertain a motion to adjourn. Oh, sorry, Chairwoman Clancy. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I just wanted to, um, comment, you know, as I listen to those meetings and or those comments, um, many from our region's mayors, our St. Louis County mayors and others, um, I'm struck by how often I heard the term equitable. Um, I think that everyone within St. Louis County government and certainly on this committee and on the council very much cares about um, distributing CARES Act funding in a way that is equitable. However, I think that we are defining equitable differently. When I use the term equitable, I'm thinking about where the need is greatest, not everyone getting the same thing. Um, and I think that that is different than many of the comments that I heard. For example, we know that in North County, um, the need um, from the impact of COVID looks vastly different than it does in other parts of St. Louis County, such as West County, for example. Um, so I agree um, in many ways that we need to make sure that our distribution of this money is equitable. But I, I think that um, if we are really going to center equity based around need, we need to make some changes to the proposal that has been submitted um, from the Municipal League and on behalf of the mayors. Thank you, Chairwoman Clancy. I 100% agree with what you just said. Um, okay. So, any other final comments, questions? Uh, move, move for adjournment. Great. If that is in, in order. Did any? Did uh? I think I heard Council Councilwoman and, Gray came on. Oh, okay. Yeah. I didn't know she was on. Sorry. I, I think I heard a second there, didn't I? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you all so much for being here this morning and I look forward to seeing you all later. Thank you. Have a good day.